Hello everybody, June here. I don't think I've talked about this at all, but the way that I became interested in sewing uh, was because I was involved in some historical reenactment when I was in my late teens and I wanted to be able to sew my own clothes for that. That was a very long time ago, but that was sort of the in way to sewing. And then eventually I decided that I just wanted to make my own clothes. Um, so I guess I've had two sewing lives. That one in the beginning where I did actually make a few easy things and then my sewing life proper that started about 15 years ago. But anyway, I tell you that because the project that I'm going to bring to you today is rooted in those very beginnings of my interest in sewing. It is rooted in historical costuming, not in the 18th century or the 19th century, but rather in the medieval period. Some years ago, I decided that I wanted to try my hand at recreating or approximating an outfit from the Manesse Codex. And this is a, a manuscript, illuminated manuscript from around the early 14th century, so the early 1300s. And in that manuscript, you can see uh, very clearly the, the variety of styles that, that people, specifically women, which is what I'm looking at, were wearing at the time. And the outfit that caught my attention is an outfit that consists of an undercoat, so a dress. It's not quite a tunic, but it's not a coat hardy as will be known um, and as it will look later in the 14th century. It's still very billowy. It's not shape forming at all. And then the surcoat is worn on top of the coat, but that is a garment for another video. But uh, I decided about I don't know, a week and a half ago, maybe two weeks ago, that this was the perfect time to start working on that. Uh, and so I did. Uh, I decided to start on the coat, obviously, because, you know, working from the inside out. I already had a chemise because before I moved to New York, I was still doing, or I, I guess I was again doing that minimal reenactment. And so I had a shift to go underneath shoes. I had all of that. So it's really just the outfit for the coat, C-O-T-E, not C-O-A-T. I'm using this pattern and the name is in French and I'm absolutely going to butcher it, but I'm going to put a screenshot of the pattern here so you can see it. Is um, the company is called La Fleur de Lise and the pattern is the people of medieval Gothic period. So roughly to the year 1240 and 1320. They have a variety of outfits. So they have, um, they have outfits for both men and women for those two years, give or take. And uh, they have for peasants and also for what they call lords and ladies. So slightly better off, financially speaking, people. And like pretty much every medieval pattern uh, around this period and before that, this is all just built around triangles and rectangles for the most part. Uh, this one, the sleeve has a little bit of shape, but you'll see that coming down um, in the rest of this video. But before I jump into the making of this coat, I don't want to say that this pattern, um, which I have used before to make uh, a similar coat slash tunic for a man, the pattern is fine. The instructions are just not there. They assume that you know how to do a lot of things. For example, the instructions for the gore say, cut the gore so you're neat in style, stitch all eight gores to the body, straight sides together, matching dots. That's it. So if you have never sewn anything like this, you will need to go find instructions somewhere else. You will need to find actual sewing directions for these kinds of tunics on the internet. That is not difficult to do. There's a lot of that. Uh, because we have this Society for Creative Anachronism, which is very much involved and interested in all kinds of medieval costuming, and there's a lot of resources for those kinds of things out there. So putting it out there, pattern is fine. Instructions, not so great. On the plus side, the pattern does have a lot of historical information, which is great. Uh, it is a lot more historically accurate and a lot more historically um, informed than what you will find with patterns like Burda or the costume patterns for, you know, Simplicity, Butterick, McCall's, whatever it may be. So with that out of the way, let's uh, get to making this thing. The first thing I did was obviously trace the pattern. 
I never cut my patterns because I want to be able to use them in the future for other sizes. So I traced them and before I cut them out, I shortened the body three inches and I shortened the sleeves two inches. Obviously with the shortening of the body goes the shortening of the gores. And what you see me cutting here is the gore. So this is the first set of four sets. So it's a total of eight gores. And I had already cut the actual body out of fabric, but because it was so long and it doesn't fit on my cutting table, I had to do it in my dining room. So on my dining room table. And I did record cutting the body, but silly me forgot that my camera was set to manual focus from a previous project. And so all of the footage that I have of that is out of focus, which is funny because uh, I struggled quite a bit trying to make the body front and back fit on one with a fabric. So that would have been hilarious for you to watch. But here I'm just, again, continuing to pin and cut these gores and uh, there's a lot of them. After I cut the gores, I cut the sleeves. In a lot of these early period patterns, the sleeves are rectangles. But if you see here, these leaves are actually shaped. Well, they're not shaped in that they're not curved, but they are not rectangles, they're trapezoidal. I am cutting them on the fold here. And there's no right or left sleeve, they're both the same. But even though they are trapezoids, they still have a gusset that will go between the sleeves and the body later in the construction process. After I cut everything out, I started working on the back of the coat. The first thing I did was work on the center back gores. And this is something that the pattern is not explicit about, but you have to sew the bias side of the gores to the straight side of the center back seam. Because if you sew the straight side of the gore to the straight side of the back, it means that then when you sew the gores together, you'll have bias seam on bias seam, and that will just stretch. So bias to straight, and then straight to straight. In the historical period, the gores at the center back and center front were often added by cutting a slit into the body of the gown. But this gown has a center back seam and also has a center front seam. So my process here was to sew one gore to each side of the back, then sew the gores down the center seam of the back to one another, and then finally sew the seam from the neckline to the gore. I repeated this for the side gore, so I sewed one side gore to one side of the back, one side gore to another side of the back, and then those eventually get to be sewn to the front of the gown. That completed the main construction for the back, and it meant that now my bag had four gores, one at each side and two at the center. And then I repeated the exact same process for the front. To join the front and the back, I started by sewing the shoulder seams together, just pretty normal stuff, shoulder seam to shoulder seam. Then I started to sew the gussets onto the sleeves, which is what I'm doing here. I made sure to mark all my points, and then I took this to the sewing machine and sewed the first side. Then I sewed the second side, and I started to pin the body of the sleeve to sew it, and then I realized that um, I actually made a mistake. I sewed the gusset to the sleeve wrong. As you can see here, this is not what a gusset is supposed to look like. It just looks like a protrusion on the sleeve. And so, yeah, big mistake. Obviously, I was a little bit rusty. I This is not a tutorial on how to sew a gusset, but I'm going to leave a tutorial for Morgan Donner in the description that you can go see it because she does explain it very well. Obviously, I messed up. And then uh, a lot of uh, seam ripping ensued. Then I sewed it again the correct way. You can see here it looks totally different. It actually looks like a gusset. With the sleeves constructed, I went ahead and I sewed them to the body of the gown. The side seams were still open, so I sewed from the end of the gusset to the other end of the gusset and attached them that way. And then the last thing to do was to sew the side seams, which I did by sewing again from gore point to the hem and then from the bottom of the sleeve gusset to where the gores for the side body began. 
Then I tried the gown on for fit, which I didn't film, but in the end, I needed to shorten the sleeves another two inches, and I'll talk about the body in a moment. But after trying it on, I decided that it was best to finally finish the neckline so that it didn't stretch a lot. I did have to fudge a little bit with the center. So here you can see the center back seam, but on the center front, I had to take it in. So at the very top of the neckline, there's about an inch of seam allowance and tapering down to nothing, about six inches down. But uh, I am finishing the neckline here with bias tape. I didn't have any bias tape, the exact color of the gown, but it's fine, it's close enough, and you really can't see it from the outside when I'm wearing it. In terms of construction, the tunic is finished. All I have to do is hem it, and I have already tried it on, and I know how much I have to take off from the hem to fit. Uh, it is very, very long, and I did let the whole thing hang overnight because I wanted to see how much it would sag in places like the side and so for example um, I have to remove about four centimeters from the center front but as you can see the sides are longer and at the side seam it goes to about 11 centimeters so what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit here on the floor and I am going to take a ruler and I'm going to start marking all the way around the same distance from the floor to where my uh, hem needs to be and there's so much fabric in this so it's going to be a while After measuring the hem I went ahead and I pressed the hem and then sat down to a very long session of hand sewing it is a very wide hem. I am kind of disappointed in the quality of this footage. It is a new camera that I'm trying out and it's not the greatest, but you know, it is what it is. But anyway, seems like I sewed this hem forever. But after the hem was done, that was it. And the gown was finished. The sleeves were supposed to have some trim at the hem side, but I was going to an event and I ran out of time. So maybe that is a project for another day. And here is the finished gown out in my concrete jungle of Brooklyn, New York. As you can see, it is very voluminous uh, in the body. The sleeves are a little bit tapered to the wrist, but not too much. Look at that wind. It was very windy that day. I actually love how it came out. I did not make my hair dress, but this is a crispinette, or actually it's a snood. Uh, and then a barbette, and then the round thing on the top of my head is called a fillet. And I didn't make it because I did not enjoy making 18th century caps and I didn't think I would enjoy making this. So I just bought it instead. Here's a close-up of my neckline. And here you can see the gusset under one of my arms. I think it came out pretty good despite my initial snafu. But that's it. That is the dress. I love how it came out. And that is the end for the making of this coat slash tunic. I will be making the surcoat eventually. But again, that's a story for another day. And that is all that I have for you today. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button. It really helps the algorithm. And I will see you next time. Bye.